Jamaican rum is known for its high esters. Those are the compounds that give it the heady aroma it has and makes it taste all banana-y, pineapple-y, and fruity. Some also call it funk, but our guest calls it magic. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time by the best in the industry. Christelle Harris is well-versed in esters, muck, and funk, as she is the granddaughter of the owner of Hamden Estate, one of the oldest continuously running distilleries in Jamaica. She was in London for UK Rum Fest and sat down with me to explain exactly why Hamden Estate Rum has such a fanatical fan base. But first... Don't know what to get your loved ones for the holidays? Well, head over to LushLifeCocktailTours.com to buy gift vouchers for the perfect tour for the cocktail lovers in your life. You'll be introduced to some of the most famous bars and bartenders in London Soho, all while sipping their celebrated cocktails. The most fun you can have in London, but I'm kind of biased. Now let's get on with the show and the funkiest rum on the market, or so the rumors lead us to believe. Now, I grew up in Kingston, Jamaica, um, well, until I was 14. My family was still always there. But when I was 14, I went to boarding school in Canada, but I was still at home every long weekend. Every long weekend? Every long weekend. That's a long way to fly every weekend. Uh, well, there was a direct flight. It was four hours. Um, I'm the only child. It's only four hours from Jamaica to... From, from Kingston to Toronto, if there's a direct flight, it's only four hours. Oh, my goodness. I would so that was that easy. it is so far. Yes, that is easy. Um, but, yeah, I was very spoiled, eh? Wait, no, well, I was just thinking, <laughs> you, did you want to go home every I long did. weekend? Well, yeah, well, mm, I suppose for the first year, yes, I did. Actually, I don't know if I'm lying or not. I can't really remember. It was so long. It was like 20 plus years ago. Um, I wanted to, I suppose I liked flying and my family was very overprotective. Okay. And so they booked me in business at 14 and 15 years old. Yes. And they, Air Canada at that time, <laughs> they didn't really card you. I mean, even it's though they knew out. I was a minor, it was okay. They were like, okay, would you like wine? And he didn't. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Just give me the whole bottle. I love it. Um, I quite liked flying. It was love. It was a lovely experience. Of course, when you're flying business class. Oh, for God's nice. sake, of course. Uh-huh. Um, because they were so overprotective. You know, they, they didn't want me exposed to... But the truth is, Jamaica is kind of small. And at the time, um, my family was very big in the horse racing industry. And the horse racing industry is a business that really got a lot of attention from all demographics across Jamaica. So, although I myself was not an owner or a trainer... I was, my, my face was quite easily recognized. Mm-hmm. So um, they didn't want me easily recognized on the plane or feeling like I was identified or, you know, um, perhaps in a vulnerable position as a minor. Mm-hmm. So they booked me business. <laughs> I suppose that was their reasoning. I didn't really complain about it. <laughs> I actually I did that. complain about it sometimes. I was like, I don't really understand. It's like three times the price. What's the point? Like, you know, now it, don't you wish? It, now it's great to fly business all the time. Oh, absolutely! I don't think, yeah, there'd be no complaining. Sometimes I do. I, I do <laughs> feel a little bit, you know, unnecessarily extravagant, though. I have to admit, uh, it's a long flight between here and Jamaica. Nah, I mean, uh, if you've had a really rough night, you just sleep anyway. So <laughs> it depends. So, yeah. um, so, so you were in Toronto, though. So, yeah. I grew up mm-hmm. in. Jam- I, I grew up in Kingston. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a, a lovely childhood. Although I was actually discussing this last night, I think the opportunities for kids to enjoy themselves, um, go to the park and the museum and these things, it doesn't really exist too much at home. Mm -hmm. We do have lovely beaches, though. (laughs) You do. Um, And a great uh, culture and historically in music. Um, But I grew up in Kingston and I went to school in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I went to boarding school when I was 14, so that was four years. It was a great experience. Did uh, you stay there for college? I stayed there for four years of college as mm-hmm. well. Did um, you think you would always stay there, or did you know that already oh, no, that I there was something was, no. you were going to come back knew, to? No, I always knew I was going home. Okay. It wasn't really a... Perhaps it's an only child thing. Perhaps it's because my family is really protective, and I'm so close with them. Um, 
even generationally, I'm very close to my mom and my dad, as well as my grandmother Mm -hmm. and my grandfather, who was alive at the time. I mean, he passed away eight plus years ago. But before that, I, he was my macaroni, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> I was his plummy. Mm-hmm. I was always it was a bit chunky. <laughs> so um, I was very close with my with my mom's side of the family who lived in Jamaica. Did you know what already what you wanted to do? I still don't know what I want <laughs> to do, darling. <laughs> All right, that you I, would you no. would end up coming back to um, be part of the business, the family business. Yeah, nobody in my family went to school, went to uh, university. I was the first person to go to university in my family. Um, even though I went to university, I kind of always knew I would come back and work with them. Mm-hmm. Just because um, they had built so much already. Um, my mother, she she made sandwiches and delivered them to gas stations and imported Tetra Packs to package her sandwiches in when I was a ch- when I was a young girl um that was her first uh, foray into entrepreneurialism um and then my grandparents had all these businesses and they they really built up from from nothing my grandfather was a farmer my grandmother was always by his side um and when my mom did her little sandwich business then they decided that they were that my grandparents were opening this pharmacy um, my mom used to go to the pharmacy and learn how to... She learned how to do payroll over the phone with a friend of my grandfather's who was an accountant. Um, she kind of did everything, you know, by hand. It was all pen and paper. Mm-hmm. But if you're lucky, I calculate. So uh, that's how they kind of built everything. And that's what I grew up seeing. Um, I started working when I was eight. My parents... Well, I went to I went to work at, when I was eight. It was Christmas Eve, and it was a pharmacy or a drugstore. You know, we also had, it was a convenience store, drugstore, gift shop. And they had one free cash register because somebody didn't turn up or they were on the floor or something. I don't know. I went on the cash register. I didn't really know what to do, but I started cashing and bagging items. Um, when I was younger, my mother always said, you want to go to the mall and hang out? hang out what is this hanging out (laughs) hanging out is for losers we don't do that you come into work Mm -hmm. so if I wasn't going to tennis practice which I I used to do every Saturday and Sunday and uh, on the weekends if it was even during the summer I'd go to tennis practice in the day go home take a shower go to work so that work ethic was built in to your family. This is always what I did. Mm-hmm. So even though I went to university, I had the opportunity. There was nothing that really, you know, um, struck a chord with me that ignited a fire. Um, yes, I always liked having an audience, but I didn't really know where to channel that. Um, in Jamaica, at the time when I was growing up, performing performance arts wasn't really you, there was there wasn't that much of an opportunity to really explore that. Um, when I was in university, yes, I used to dance. Um, I spent probably more time in the dance studio than I did in the lecture halls. Maybe equal time. Um, I did discover a passion there, but I was quite heavy. I was uh, close to 200 pounds when I was 17. Oh so I was a chunky monkey. <laughs> um, so even though I was good at it, and I, I did start late, um, it wasn't really something that I thought I could pursue as a career which perhaps in in retrospect that was probably a good thing um and so when I went back to Jamaica after university now um I was a little bit I I felt a little bit it was it was it was a very different experience to being in Toronto when I could walk anywhere go anywhere on the TTC on the public transportation and kind of just not have to answer. It's a big city. I, I, my parents didn't even allow me to get my driver's license in Jamaica until I was like 25, because no, that's a lie. I was 21, but long story. I'm not going to get into that (laughs) one. Um, because they didn't want me to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Actually, until I was 25, even though I had my license, I couldn't go anywhere except for work. I went from home to work. I know I live with my grandmother, Mm -hmm. so. I was always monitored. I still am monitored. She has cameras at home. When I come home late at night, she wakes up the next morning and she goes, 
So how was it last night? I saw you came in at two o'clock. Who were you with? I'm like, for God's sake, I'm 35 years old. I'm 36 now. Like, give me a little bit of a break. But she's actually, she tries to be non-judgmental about her question. I think anyone who lived with their parents that would get that. So yeah. (laughs) And she has cameras. She doesn't, she says she doesn't have them inside the house, but she has them on the outside. So she, and she has them in her room, the monitor in her room. I'm like, grandma, how can you sleep like that? The light is shining so bright. I'm like, you can't sleep. She said, that's how I like it. I'm like, yes, because you like to watch everything in your life anyway. So yeah, I live with my grandma though. That's always very exciting. (laughs) Well, were they always, do they always have, you know, rum in their life at uh-uh. that point when you were young? No, so rum is actually one of our most recent um, businesses. So as I said, when I was growing up, there was a pharmacy business. Mm-hmm. Well, before I was born, there was a dry cleaning business. Then there was a pharmacy business. Uh, there's two locations for that. A dry cleaning business, there's a nine branches and one head office, one plant. Um, then there was a boutique hotel operation that we acquired in 2001 um with that we also added a gaming room or a casino but there's no live dealers so it's all electronically operated gaming machines um we built from that there's now five locations of that but that's still the biggest one mm-hmm. um mostly everything is in kingston but one one gaming room is in montego bay and one license for a gaming room is actually being transferred to Mandeville, which is about two hours outside of Kingston. It's going to be open by the end of this month, so the end of November 2019. Um, after that, then we went into Rome. But that was only because my grandfather, who he was a farmer when he was younger. His father was a farmer as well. And he was a boy at the time when sugar was king in Jamaica and it was always his his lifelong dream to own a sugar factory and the opportunity came up the government was divesting their assets because they couldn't make pro- they, it, it, the sugar sugar factories in Jamaica were not profitable they couldn't make a profit with any sugar factories and so they were divesting some of these assets so put in a bid and my family won the bid for this sugar factory with this sugar factory, Long Pond Sugar Factory, came a rum distillery, Hamden Rum Distillery. I said, what on earth is this Hamden Rum Distillery nobody's ever heard of? The only thing we've ever heard of in Jamaica is Appleton. Well, of course. With the, the biggie. With, with, yeah, with the, with the successful brands, Appleton. So with that, um, Hamden was this thing where, as I said, in Jamaica, nobody knows anything except for the two brands that were really established. When I first went to Hamden, it was like I was walking into the scene from what you would imagine described in a Charles Dickens novel. Mm -hmm. There were cobwebs everywhere. It was like I was walking into somewhere from the 17th century, no lie. Was it working or just... It was working. Oh. This distillery that nobody had ever heard of was working. I had no idea what the hell it was producing because nobody had ever heard of it. Turns out that Hamden was producing rum in bulk, shipping across to Europe, not aging in Jamaica, but shipping it straight off over to Europe. And it was extremely profitable. But because it was, I don't, I don't, I, I can't. But it was linked to this sugar factory. So it was not actually linked to the sugar factory. They're two completely separate entities. Geographically, they're 45 minutes away from each other. They have nothing to do with each other. But I guess in the bid to buy. But in the bid to buy, the sugar ah. factory, I mean, the, the rum distillery was thrown in to, I, I assume, sweeten the deal. Because very much perhaps so. the government knew, or perhaps... I, the, the sugar industry in Jamaica has been on a decline for some years now. Right. And in fact, since then, we've had to close down because we were losing so much every year that we couldn't continue to sustain mm. the losses. The other businesses that we had that were successful were subsidizing our losses in the sugar fa- in the sugar business. But after some years, we really couldn't do it anymore. So we shut down some years now, two years now. Um, we went through a redundancy exercise, which was very expensive. We were trying to avoid doing that for some years. But 
after a while you look at how much you use you're losing every year and you, you decide you know you have to do you have to mm-hmm. cut your losses oh. at some point so sugar was not so sweet but <laughs> but rum. This rum distillery that we knew nothing about and that we had well i i i definitely had underrated um at the time has turned out to be well, my passion for sure and turned out to be a very successful business. Mm-hmm. And I'm really happy that even though we didn't know anything about it at the time, and we could have made some decisions that would have changed everything about the, you know, the framework of what happens at Hamden Estate, um, we didn't. Uh, we said, we looked at it and we we're like, well, nothing here has changed pretty much since the 17th, since 1753. You know, the production process is the exact same. Um, it didn't really see it. It's, it looked like it was a bit frozen in time. I was going to say it's like like you bought a museum. Yeah, it was frozen in time. It really was so much so that when you're walking around on the ground where the pot stills are, where, which is where the distillation mm-hmm. happens, it was there were board floors, and no joke, you really felt like you could drop, like you could fall through at any point in time. So that's one thing that we changed. So we go, we took mostly stra- scrap health and safety. Yeah, health and safety. Right. So we had to ensure that our our workers were actually, like, you know, mm. they would stay alive <laughs> and not hurt themselves. So we took some scrap metal that we found in the yard for the most part and um, resurfaced that that area, for example. But in the fermentation area, we were very careful not to change out anything that we didn't have to, because that. All of that, the cobwebs and 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 the board floors, and it's actually it's a part of the environment, of and course, the environment the is, is absolutely necessary to what makes our liquid our liquid. So you said it was being sold to yeah. Europe. What was it? So yeah, so you know, what what would happen to it once it left Jamaica? Right. So it's still being sold to Europe. So we inherited those relationships, and we maintain those relationships. So once it's sold to Europe those bulk rum buyers are using it for a bunch of different things. They were using it for a bunch of different things and they still are. Mm -hmm. So they're making blends for other buyers. So an independent bottler or a third party will go to them and say, Hey, okay, I want to create this rum brand. This, this is the profile Mm -hmm. I want, create it for me. And they'll use some of our rum in there or maybe all of our rum in there. We don't really know. Um, It might be a huge house. It might be an independent bottler who's going in for the first time. They also sell to the um, confectionery industry, uh, sweets, sugar. Uh, so your chocolate rum, you know, ball perhaps, could be. Perhaps, but also uh-huh. food flavorings, perhaps for savory items. Uh-huh. It's not just necessarily mm-hmm. sweet stuff. Uh, also the perfume industry. Oh, no way. Cosmetics. Yes, it's uh, there's a reason why Hamden is so well known is for our esters. Ester is really mm. a, a a unit of measurement of a, a scent, aroma, flavoring, and it's very popular within that industry. Apparently, well, it was doing so well being sold out of Jamaica. Why did you then decide to start your own? So my grandpa or bottle your you know your own label. So at the time when we bought the distillery ten years ago, when it when that deal went through, mm-hmm. um, my grandpa said, well, if the bulk rum is so profitable as like a bulk rum item that's not even aged here, why don't we start putting it down in barrels here? Because maybe they're aging it over there. We didn't even really know what they were doing. Um, took us a, you know, a few months to find out or to at least even ask the right questions. Sometimes you don't know what's happening because you don't even know what, what questions to ask. But so they would be aging it overseas as well. Um, so my grandpa said, well, if it's being aged overseas and we're selling so much overseas, it must be good for something. So we started putting on barrels at that time. And that's why we now have what we have. But we also went into the bottled rum industry and we started with a product called Rum Fire, which is a. And overproof, we did overproof because we wanted to. We wanted the consumers in Jamaica to have a gauge. They, they, we wanted them to be able to understand what they were drinking. And Ray and Nephew, which is a staple, which I I did not grow up drinking. Maybe I started drinking it when I was 18 mm-hmm. <laughs> or a little younger. But Ray and Nephew is a great product. And we knew that if we, if we bottled it at the same strength, at least the consumer would be able to understand 
you know, from experience how, how it was to be drunk. So we started with that. It was an unaged product. And I decided that I wanted to take this thing international. So I started doing all the rum shows. and With rum fire. With rum fire. And even though that was a huge learning process for me, I mean, I've learned so many lessons from that. The first rum show I went to, I didn't even have, I didn't have any decorations for my stand. I didn't even, I didn't know how it worked. I mean, here is Captain Morgan that actually built a ship inside this <laughs> exhibition center. And here I am with my, my three walls, my three white walls of my stand. And I'm like, can I go and buy a Jamaican flag from somewhere in London? Like, please. That was, I was, How many I was years ago was that? At 10. Oh, yeah. nine, nine, t- 10 years ago, I think. Uh-huh. No, nine Probably years ago. Probably one of the first rum fest yeah. here. Well, not quite the first, mm-hmm. but it was nine years ago. Mm-hmm. So it was a huge learning experience for me and something that, I mean, you, you can't pay for that. Well, so you, you kind of brought up that you said, oh, when I was 18, I drank this. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your relationship to rum itself and growing up in Jamaica and drinking rum? You know, did you... So when I was growing up, I, I don't really know if it's the same way now, perhaps not so much. Um, but I, well, being an only child and being very close with my parents, I didn't really do much without them. I was, as I said, very overprotected. Um, I didn't get the chance to go out like how my friends did. My friends would, you know, go to parties on the weekends. And uh, if I went to a party, my dad would take me. But my dad was a little bit of a partier, so it was okay. <laughs> I didn't really mind. My mom would also come sometimes. My mom would take me. My mom was much more strict, you know. Um, she was more the disciplinarian, which I give her a lot of credit for. I respect her a lot for that. Uh, I... I mean, was there rum in the house? Yeah, there was. Well, I mean, we 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 imbibe. Uh, was there a specific rum that you always drank? Well, in the there house? was. There was nothing except for at the time when I was growing up. There was nothing except for Appleton uh-huh. and my nephew. So it was always around. Obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. from Jamaica, it's always around. Uh, it's not necessarily just rum, though. Mm-hmm. In a Jamaican household, there is vodka. There is not so. Much, I didn't see gin when I was growing up, but there was vodka. There was rum and there was wine. Uh, when I was growing up, the the wine scene in Jamaica was not as uh, developed as it is now. We actually have a pretty good wine scene in Jamaica. We have some good importers. Um, uh, the rum scene, yeah, I grew up drinking rum. So you really had to um, teach yourself everything about this product that you were creating then. Absolutely. Let me tell you something. When we came up with Rum Fire, I thought I knew so much about rum because I had grown up drinking it. Uh Because I had the opportunity to, you know, it wasn't like the States where I couldn't drink rum or even London, even here, I suppose. But I was drinking rum since I was 14 and it wasn't a big deal. Uh, Yes, the drinking age, the legal drinking age is 18. But at the time, I suppose it wasn't really... I wasn't being, nobody carded me. This just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, I came here with Rum Fire really thinking I, I knew a lot about rum. And for the first few years, when I walked into a room and I started to talk about rum, I realized how little I knew. Um, people would ask me questions I couldn't even understand. I couldn't understand what the questions right. meant. I did not, it was like they were speaking a different language. Um, so I learned a lot. I've, I've learned a lot. I, I know a lot more now than I knew then, but I, I continue to learn every day because I'm certainly not a chemist or I, did, I didn't do very well in science at school. Every time somebody like Maggie Campbell or Richard Seal opens their mouth, I hold on to like, there's like little gold nuggets being dropped. The They're very scientific. They are. <laughs> and I have so much respect for them. And I consider myself absolutely privileged to even be in the same room as them, much less have, you know, a chance to offer an opinion, much less have it invited. Mm. So. Well, after Rum Fire. Yeah. Did you think, okay, that's it? We're only going to make rum fire? Or? Uh, no. So when my grandpa said when he was alive, he passed away eight years ago, but when he was alive, he said, let's put, start putting down rum. So when the rum start, when the rum got to about three years old, we wanted to try and find a buyer. 
because we weren't going to develop our own brand. I think we had already learned at that point in time that it was really difficult to, to build your own brand. And we didn't necessarily have the resources nor the know-how to do something, you know, like an age drum. We didn't really know where to go with it. So we wanted to try and sell this in bulk. And we were not getting any bites at the price that we were asking, which we thought was a very fair price for the rum in bulk. My uncle wanted to sell it at the price that he was getting offered at. And I said, Uncle Andrew, please. Uh, Andrew is, Uncle Andrew is, my, is the CEO of my group. Um, my mom's brother. And I said, Uncle Andrew, please just give me a year. Give me 12 months. Let me go back to Europe. Let me go back to the rum shows and let me speak to some people. At that time, I met Richard Seal. I, I met him before, but I really started to have a relationship with him. And it was about four years ago that I met Luca. Luca Gargano. And... My mom brought some samples to UK Rum Fest. He tasted one and he was blown away. And then he tasted another. And he said, wow, if you have 50 barrels of this, I marry you tomorrow. I looked at my mom and I'm like, mommy, I think we have about 200 barrels of this mark, right? She says, yes, we have 200. I think it's 200 of that mark. I said, Luca, we have 200. The man grabbed my face and kissed me in front of everybody. I have never been so mortified (laughs) in my life. I was mortified at the time, but that was the beginning of a great relationship. Um, So you had this treasure that you didn't even realize you had. Yeah, to be honest, even though I had been a part of the rum industry for some time, I'd been going to shows, um, I'd met a lot of people they really were Hamden heads. They they were so obsessed. I, I I didn't, in retrospect, I did not really understand at the time. I thought it was cool. I certainly, I, I knew I didn't, I knew I wasn't getting something. Now, obviously, that I understand Hamden and the production of our, of our rum in context of rum in general. I get it. Well, tell us a little bit about that. So... We haven't changed anything about our production process mm-hmm. since the 1700s. And that can't be really said for, I don't think, very many distilleries in the world at all. Um, everything about our process is absolutely the same. Uh, our water is absolutely, it's, it's, it's necessary to our production. Um, the, we don't add anything to our rum after distillation. Uh we, well, our our releases that we've done, our age drum, is the first time in history of Hamden that there has been a tropical aged, a distillery aged rum in a bottle produced by Hamden Estate. So although all these um, rum connoisseurs and rum craze fanatics all over the world have been seeking Hamden and are obsessed with Hamden, they were getting Hamden in the bottle from independent bottlers mm. sourcing Hamden that we were shipping out in bulk, but was being aged in Europe. Nothing wrong with that. That's how Hamden built its reputation. That's how. That's why all these people are so obsessed with it. That's what they built the reputation on. But they never had the opportunity to have tropical aged Hamden before. So that's what we came up with. And it is unlike any other. It's difficult to describe Hamden, and even if even if I were to go into the technical aspects of what makes a liquid so uh, important and so unique, you kind of have to go there to be able to understand it. Uh, there, there's this thing called dunder. Uh, there's this thing called muck pits. Uh, we have muck pits at Hamden. It's this. Basically, it's 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 what it's our insurance policy. It's the reason why Hamden can't be transported anywhere else. When we first took over Hamden, there was this air of mystery around it. Nobody quite understood how Hamden rum was made. The reason why that was is because nothing was ever. Nobody did interviews like this. Nobody spoke about it. Nothing was ever journaled because it was always being shipped out in bulk. 
the people working at Hamden never realized how important Hamden was to the international framework of rum. Um, so there was never any journals about it. Uh, and so there were these stories, mythical stories, and these, like, I felt like there, there was this um, symbology around Hamden as well. There were these ridiculous stories about what went into Hamden rum. So when we took over and when I started to have visitors come down, I asked the distiller at the time, I said, why is it that we don't talk about the process of rum making at Hamden? He said, well, to be honest, Christelle, there's no reason why we can't because even if we were to tell everybody exactly how we made Hamden rum, there's no way that it could be made anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. He had worked at other distilleries in Jamaica and he had tried to reproduce Hamden rum at other distilleries. And in the same vein, he had tried to reproduce other distilleries rum, rums at, it, you know, say yeah, Hamden, yeah, yeah. for example. It just can't be done because what happens at Hamden is absolute to the stays region. at Hamden. It what happens at, at Hamden, Hamden, what happens stays at Hamden, stays stays at Hamden. At Hamden. Forget Vegas. Yeah, there's no way um, to transport our production method. So there are these pits that that run underneath the fermentation house, for example. And those are called the muck pits. That can't be transported anywhere mm -hmm. else. Even if you were to take a sample out of there and try to use that as the as a starter for another fermentation batch at another distillery, that couldn't happen. It just wouldn't work. Yeah, you'd end up getting something mm -hmm. great probably, but it just won't be happening then wrong. So all of those things combined made me say, well, let's just start telling the world about our production process. Let's invite people in to see it. How so, long ago was this? Uh, about four years ago. Mm -hmm. About four or five years ago. Once I started to understand that it could not be replicated, there was no reason to keep it secret. Um, share it with the world because it really is a, it, it's really a, a, an industry treasure. Not just a national treasure, but an international industry treasure. Mm -hmm. Let's share it. So that's what I decided to do, and that's what we've done. And that's why now we have a product that is being appreciated in the way it ought to be. So we have great partners that have access to international distribution that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. Um, and with, with uh, La Maison and Bellier, with that, I'm really grateful for the opportunity, but... Uh, I, I know I wouldn't have been able to do it on my own. Um, and I know that we have a dedicated following already built on the credibility of my partners. Um, and from here, I know we will only get stronger because the rum industry is on the rise. Now you've made me really thirsty. Can I'm we sorry. open a bottle? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let's. After a sip of Hamden Estate rum, I would definitely classify myself as a Hamden head. I understand funk, and I'm in. Thanks so much to Christelle for sharing the few sacred drops she had after the UK Rumfest festivities were over. Now, of course, it's time for us to share a little of the funk and make that cocktail of the week. Since we were talking rum sours this month, I thought it would be fun to add Hamden's to the ring. So this is our cocktail of the week, the Hamden Sour. All you have to do is add the following to a shaker. 40 mLs of Hamden Estate 46, 25 mLs of fresh lemon juice, 15 mLs of sugar syrup, and 5 mLs of still water. Add ice and then shake, shake, shake. Strain directly into a coupette glass or rocks without ice. Then garnish with a lemon slice, fresh or dried. Close your eyes and you are on one of Jamaica's beaches. You can find this recipe, more rum recipes, and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com, where you'll also find all the ingredients in our shop. I decided I would be serving a few of these sours at Thanksgiving. Usually we have a Bloody Mary or... An apple bourbon cocktail? Not saying that I won't have one of those, but I'll add a rum sour to the menu to shake things up this year. By the way, have a wonderful holiday, everyone. 
If you live for Lush Life, would you consider supporting us by buying us a coffee? Just go to buymeacoffee.com slash Lush Life and you can donate once or monthly to make sure we are still here every Tuesday. By the way, theme music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and always used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leaves me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly. Okay, the second part was mine. Up and coming on Lush Life, we meet the head distiller of one of the most famous distilleries in Scotland, who never had to veer far from home to find his dream job. Until next time, bottoms up. Bottoms up.